Welcome to the first ever Gloucester Writers Center Poetry Salon. Hooray! <laughs> quarterly and to host a wide array of practicing poets, both local and national. Mm. And in accordance with Gloucester poetic tradition, the loose theme of this series is poetry and place. Please welcome Katie Peterson. Mm. Right. Spring. <clears throat> I have been trying to read King Lear. end up drinking red wine and talking about the tropics. <laughs> Thought there might be a poem in the play. Maybe the way he talks about the button on his coat before he dies standing carrying the body of the hanged. Maybe the part where she refuses to bargain and the maps on the table are redrawn. I am sleeping. Elsewhere, you are finishing Tess of the Durbervilles. Those last chapters, before they end up at Stonehenge, an angel says to Tess, Sleepy, my dear, I think you are lying on the altar. The part where the book lets them hold each other without sleepwalking or lies. Angel has traded in his harp for a tin kettle and bread. They picnic in a damask-curtained bed, a fugitive and an accomplice. I may be turning toward the branch of apple blossom bearing its burden of the raindrops in an even more buoyant aspect than the night before. Now you are the caretaker finding Tess's fine silk stockings draped on the damask coverlet in the house they squat in, giving both of them away. The tree in the side yard not yet in the kind of flower to release it and uncover it again. Everything, everything. And before everything, the possibility of something else. The moment when a moral gets minced by an account a body makes of any other body and time takes place instead of taking time. Cordelia, with the armies of her husband scouring the unharvested corn of her homeland for her naked wandering delusional father. Tess at the dairy, good at her job. Angel in the field, his fingers on the springs of his harp. You carrying me into a lake in August, the summer my mother left the earth. It was hard to start writing these poems and I decided for a while that I could only write poems about the four days surrounding the death. And one of the things that happens, I think, when you limit yourself to place, it's the, the wisdom of monastics and contemplatives that you develop an elsewhere in your head. And sometimes it's very specific. You know, if you're in one room, your elsewhere is another specific room. It's just as confined as the confinement you've given yourself. Um, and this poem is called Animals. So the, the, the reason why I said that before this poem is that um, this, isn't about, this isn't about the week around that death. It's about the house I was living in last year. But to me, in my mind, there seemed to be this weird parallel relationship between the confinement of that, of that yard and the confinement of the, of the yard where I grew up. So animals. On Raymond Street, across from the park, where the Christmas lights stay up all year, a girl says to her mother that the piece of cake she ate with a scoop of ice cream on top was as big as the Great Wall of China. <laughs> How do you know about the Great Wall of China? The mother asks, turning her bicycle around. Not a young mother, 
but healthy. She takes care of herself. She has her own bike for training, not just for riding with her daughter. The girl does not think this is a real question. You can tell by her face into what's next so completely, she says, with enthusiasm, we pin the tail on the donkey. I understand the love for the donkey. Like you could love it without thinking of its being pinned. Like the pinning the tail part and the donkey part stayed separate. <laughs> Not even that reality and make-believe stayed separate, but that pinning wasn't the only way to touch the donkey. <laughs> when I was that girl's age, I played an easier game. At school, on someone's birthday, we got to write on the chalkboard. The competition was to list as many animals as we could name inside a minute. I knew cat and dog. Then I wrote jackal. Mm -hmm. How did you know that? My teacher said. She wasn't satisfied with the world book being the answer. She wanted to know who let me understand what I had found. The mother and the daughter ride off together into the world behind the park where the daughter can't go alone under the lights through a corridor of maples. They have trouble hearing each other because of their helmets. But they look forward. They've done this before. I am watching them from the four-way stop where no one stops completely but strangers. The four-way stop, oracle of accidents, equal distributor of delay, something to obey. It happens all of a sudden, even after all the planning and the packing. You're in the car, you're driving, you're watching the signs. I didn't want to stop, but when I dropped off again, I took the next exit toward a kind of complex I could see. Big diner, gas station, long row of tiny motel rooms, half a neon cowboy. I was nervous, but nobody looked at me twice. And by the time I pulled up to number 15, I got my mother's good suitcase and the rest of my tuna fish sandwiches in on the bed. I felt pretty good. I locked the door, both locks, and unwrapped another sandwich and drank a glass of water from the tap with a toast to my escape. To leave home without making the bed, it's like building a house of cards. You have to know what you're doing. Are we lucky or just very quiet? I have had a letter from another world to speak of method, empathy, our times, time, disappears with me. Sleep a minute. Empathy is marked with incomprehensible corrections. The camera must be open. I know what I tell myself. Sometimes he seems to be the camera. Who we will be later. Do you like boats? I see you around boats. Built around an unseen principle to float. He's come such a long way to think, to bring to a stop and keep standing at the edge when death won't take you. Hundreds of children. The camera turns the corner. We're never any closer. Sometimes he is the camera. I arrive too late to see the lawyer. I found the house without trouble. It was so friendly and plain. The porch light was on. I went up and looked into the mailbox, and there was a key to the door in an envelope. I got back into the car and headed down to where I'd noticed a food store. I picked up some tea and milk, bread and butter, a coffee mug, a couple of light bulbs. 
The next time I took the key from my pocket, I unlocked the door. Would there be furniture, squirrels in the attic? I switched on a light right there, which worked. The house was smaller than it looked from the street, old, clean, and almost empty. Because they faced me, I climbed the steep steps to the second floor, still carrying the bag from the store. A single bed upstairs in one of two tiny bedrooms. Bathroom with a big tub and black and white linoleum tile floor, marbled from another time. Downstairs, an apple green kitchen, old, some cracked green tiles around a deep double sink. Stove and refrigerator, white, from the slightly rounded era. For a mica kitchen table, red. And three painted wooden chairs, one white, two yellow. I almost expected to find food in the refrigerator, as in a fairy tale. But it was turned off and unplugged. I got it going and put in the milk and butter. Because of your training, you may believe that you have broken the law. The longing has started. But one must look inside instead, a voice said. Look in the place it comes from. Thick walls, indoor sunlight, a place to wait. Some days have gone by. I've been sleeping a lot in the little bed upstairs, barely stir from the house. Got some stuff from the store in the Chinese place downtown and called the lawyer's office from there late and left a message. I have no idea who I could be, given the chance to reconsider. How familiar it feels. Not like it's my house, but like the house is my friend. There's a slanted skylight in the center of the front room that the late morning sun shines into. And I sit beneath it lately, since the rain has stopped and the lawn chair covered with a blanket. Brings it back somehow. TB sanitarium. Sanatorium is the real word. Shipboard romance. Sometimes I drop off, and when I wake up, I don't know where I am. Along a length of two by four, near the site of some unfinished remodeling, a few bees. Looking almost set there. Quiet, maybe dead. Or do they sleep? A somewhat rusted wood stove. Oh, now this is the life, I was thinking. And maybe saying out loud to myself as I picked up pieces of wood debris from around the yard. I built a fire the way I do everything, not quite right. And I felt so satisfied. <laughs> to have the day, and the next day, too. I feel safe here. Funny, the sensation of freedom near water, when really there are fewer places to go and close without a boat. Bought a book a few months ago because of the word ocean in the title, Now I Live on Ocean Avenue. Maybe at one time the ocean could be seen from my street. Of course, it's different when it happens to you. And Mary wasn't a relative. She was a friend of my mother's from when I was young, a nurse who took care of me once in the hospital and rubbed me all over with a rose-smelling lotion. Her husband was trouble. Why did she stay with him? She told my mother that she couldn't talk about it. Then one day she disappeared. It was shocking, and we missed her. We never found out where she'd gone. I didn't forget her, but I hadn't had her actively in mind for a while when the letter came. I called the lawyer and discovered that she left me the house. No explanation, no special note. Had she heard my mother was dead? In the will, she only said that she remembered me fondly and was sure I'd put the house to good use. None can tell more than she knows. I've been walking around the harbor and the streets of the town with my camera. When I come home and download the pictures, I see the other town, the one I'm always looking for. That's it. <laughs>